it was kind of, kind of an odd, uh, odd week. Uh, we've been walking through Matthew, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, somewhere along the line, I talked to uh, to Rick Grace. Like I said, he's going to be speaking next week, and he he told me uh, I don't remember exactly which passage he was going to do. I'm like, well, that's right there about where I was going to be. Um, and I realized early in the week that I, I needed to, to deviate. And it's been, um, it's been reinforced to me over and over again um, over the past week. You know, just certain things coming into, uh, into focus and saying, okay, this is the moment to, to say some things. Uh, and, and God does that. His timing is interesting. I wouldn't have chosen this timing, but that's okay. It's not for me to choose. Uh, but I want to start out by asking, you, have you heard any good rumors lately? <laughs> Nobody's going to share? <laughs> so, so here's the deal. Uh, I knew that if I said that, there's a few of you who will remember. I never saw it, obviously, but apparently there was a time where Mickey kind of confronted the congregation about gossip. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> I think we're in one of those tumultuous times where People speculate about the direction of the church. Maybe they wonder about you know what's happening and, and what people's motivations are and things like that. And so what I'm actually offering is you the opportunity to just ask me questions as a pastor. Uh, and that's the way I want to start out today. Um, if you've got any questions about my position on anything in the church, I, I don't have secrets. Um, I really don't. Um, if you got a question about maybe something you think the board's been discussing, I'll, I'll give you my best description of, of what we've been talking about. Um, if you've got questions about, you know, what it is that we do, some of the things that we do, um, I'm giving you an opportunity to ask. Um, so I, I just want to place that out there. Like I said, part of this week of networking, um, I had a DHF leadership conversation. That's that Disciple Heritage Fellowship. And we talked about anxiety in the church. Do we have reasons for anxiety in the church? Everything that's going on, all the craziness we've talked about. I, I figured letting people talk about what's going on is a good opportunity for us to, to really settle down and realize, you know, maybe we worry about things too much. So seriously, any good rumors? Anything you wonder about, you know, me, about, uh, about where the church is headed? You are given free reign to ask. No? How about, let's see here, chili supper. Has anybody heard any rumors about that? Canceled, yeah, yeah. One of the rumors is <laughs> uh, that I just sort of canceled unilaterally, and it, it it runs really close in parallel to uh, to to what it was. Uh, so the chili supper, you know, part of the thing is um, that that's a big commitment, and I think a lot of us had some issues uh, concerned about reserving a, a location. It's a lot of money, things like that. We're not sure what COVID restrictions will look like. Um, so I absolutely advocated for it in a board meeting one night. And, uh, and then we needed to make a decision. And uh, because we needed to make a decision because of the contract, I, I called and we made the decision. Um, so Mary Jane handles the contracts. So I needed to let her know. And I, I think the idea was that maybe I made that decision unilaterally, but there was a pretty good consensus amongst us uh, in the board meeting and, and then later on when I talked to people. Um, that, you know, it was time to set it aside. And here's the thing. It's really close to true in that I advocated heavily for it, not just because of COVID, but because I thought we needed a break. Uh, I, it doesn't mean we won't return to it at some point. It could be next year. I think it was a really great event last year. But I think that there's some things that we do sometimes that wear us out as a church. This is an opportunity to not be worn out one particular year. So. That's kind of where that goes. I, if you have any questions on what that means or, or my position on that, um, feel free to ask. But I know there's a rumor that I just sort of unilaterally did that thing. Um, I advocated heavily for it. But I, I did seek some consensus because I think God builds consensus in his church. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. Any any other? Yeah. Yep. Yep. In coronavirus, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, really, all I can speak to is, is you know, events in our church. Um, so I can't tell you his purpose. I can tell you the effect of, of COVID. Uh, I, I think I've seen this church transform over the last two and a half years. Um, I think I've seen us go from I got here 
it was not an easy time to come here, you know, as a church. Um, there were declining numbers. The finances were in disarray. Um, I didn't even realize it, how much until a couple months in, you know, and sitting down in a board meeting, and we looked at it, and a lot was going on. And I think people were concerned, uh, more, more than concerned. There was a lot of anxiety, you know, uh, a lot of insecurity. And what's happened is a lot of that's been turned around. It's leveled out. You know, if you look at the decline, there's a leveling out point before you can go back up again. I think what COVID has done has, is brought back some, some of the anxieties that I saw. So what's God's purpose in that? I'm not sure. I think sometimes he challenges us. I think that's a challenge for the church is to work through those things. And that's probably part of what my message is going to be today. As far as a purpose, I, I don't know. There have been pandemics before. I don't know what the purpose was. <laughs> Sometimes my answer is I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? Daniel 12.2. Daniel 12.2. What's... Tell me what that one is. A time of trouble coming. Time of trouble coming. That's like never before or ever will be again. Yeah. I, th I, think, uh, yeah, I think the interesting thing is, too, that God has carried his, his people and his church through a couple times. 1918 pandemic, you know, the swine flu pandemic, there's been world wars, there's been civil wars, there's been all kinds of stuff on dramatic levels, and sometimes we forget that. Uh, right now, most of our anxiety is probably through the things we see on TV or on social media. I should put down my phone sometimes, <laughs> not watch Facebook, or not read Facebook. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I've been supporting uh, missionaries, because I know quite a bit of that money is going towards it. Which, what money are we talking about? From the Chili Supper. Oh, from the Chili Supper, sure. Okay, so the Chili Supper, um, he, a certain portion of it did, and one of the things that we've talked about, and this was just an idea that was thrown out, that we'll discuss as a board, is some of our fundraising efforts. They're just sort of general fundraising efforts, and I talked about, you know, maybe we should think of our fundraising efforts as contributing to something outside of the church. You know, recognize that tithes and offerings really support the day-to-day -day operations. Um, right now, we're able to support most things. We do have Christmas in the country. We've got a lot of things coming up. Um, Phil's been doing a really great job of tracking where we're at in terms of our cash reserves. Um, that's an important measure of where a church is at. And when we started to make a turnaround financially, um, we were down, I mean, maybe even under three month reserve. Um, and right now we're over seven, I believe. Uh, so the thing is we might, we might want to do some things, uh, but we don't need to feel any sense of desperation about it. And honestly, there's been diminishing returns, I think, on Chili Supper over the last couple of years. It's been a good, big event, but uh, we don't need to be thinking about it as something we just desperately need to, to seek to, to, to replace, I guess. Uh, our, our budget covers our missionaries and, and what we're doing right now covers a lot of things, and I think what we're going to see over this, this next year is we're going to be redirecting a little bit. Um, and that may be challenging for some people. And like I said, we may come back to a chili supper. I think it might be a slightly different tone when we do it. I was thinking maybe a, a, an ongoing option. Like doing eBay and having small groceries. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, um, that I would say is we're not in the same position where we're desperate for funds. Um, and I, I can't claim any, uh, I think the only thing I really did when I saw that we were struggling two and a half years ago was um, tell people to be calm, that God was in control. And then the leaders of the church, you know, the board, um, we, we did things with the budget, you know, uh, everybody stepped in and kind of trimmed and, and we, we got rid of the fat. Um, honestly, you know, uh, we, we couldn't afford having a second person on staff. Um, that's helped us out. There's some stuff that maybe isn't the most you know, you wouldn't think it was the most positive things, but they've helped us out. And so we're, we're in a pretty stable position. The crazy thing is we've made it through COVID in a really stable position. Um, I'd be surprised if this month, I haven't talked to Phil about it, I could see things being down a little bit this month. Maybe that's just me projecting because we had to buy a car that we weren't anticipating buying. <laughs> um, 
but but yeah, so that's that's kind of one of the things that I think makes this an important moment where we're at right now as a church. Yeah, Phil. If I can just throw in there, I don't know really how many people know this, but you're talking about the missionaries. And uh, we we do support a group mm -hmm. of missionaries, you know, besides Chili Supper fundraising. Yeah. As a matter of fact, every every month I send out a, a group of checks to missionaries. If you're interested, there's a little world map outside the sanctuary there that lists who we who we support. And uh, like I said, we send them a, send all of them a check every month. Yeah. So just because we're not doing the chili supper, we're still supporting our missionaries and we do support them on you know a year round basis. Yeah. I think we should be, you know, really proud about the support we give to our missionaries. Yeah. Yeah, this church has a heart for missions. I think it's part of our identity as a church, and I think it's something that will continue. When I said we were talking about uh, some of the fundraising and kind of thinking of it as funding that, one of the interesting things is the garage sale and things like Christmas in the country, those numbers almost parallel our, uh, our giving you know, to missionaries. Uh, it, it's really impressive, you know, some of the, some of the things that are accomplished. Uh, it's not kept in the books that way because, you know, that would require a certain type of bookkeeping and all, all kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, the things that we do are, are important, and uh, I think that as, uh, as the church moves forward, we're going to see, uh, we're going to see other ways of, of accomplishing that support. You know, we can do things like a chili supper, but we're not going to feel like we absolutely have to meet a certain measure in order to get by. I, I think, I think we're, we're past that and we need to recognize it. I think God's provided, and I think by feeling a sense of desperation about money, I think that we are not respecting what God has done. Uh, and that, I think that would be the message that, um, that I put out on that. Um, and, and yeah, uh, amazing, amazing giving. For a church this size, too, I, I think I looked at the percentage of giving, and we do a lot more than most churches this size. Uh, it, it's very impressive. That's something we want to continue. We did have a, a couple of, of small cuts, and I think our goal is to bring those back up to the level they were, you know, when we get the chance. So, any any other questions? I mean, let me look here. I, I think another thing that's floated around is a Opry. <laughs> oh, somebody, I'm not going to say who, somebody was floating some texts and saying, oh, I hear you canceled Opry. You know, you're not doing it anymore. Uh, we're not doing it right now. I don't know what the future holds for the Opry. Um, I'm not going to get into exactly who or how that got out there. Uh, the reason I, I wonder about it is the band is, is uh, up there in age, and I'm not sure they want to be back and exposed. And it is music oriented, and so that's a big chance for exposure. Um, so I don't know, that, that's the answer there, but somebody's floated that we just sort of part launch canceled it and decided that, that was not something we would support. Um, and that's, that's just blatantly untrue. Uh, I, I was sitting in with the band and, and really loved that. Um, and if we get a chance again, it may be something very different in the future. It may be that we don't have the same number of people that we have, but um, that's part of the legacy of this church. And I think we, we need to remember it and we need to keep our eyes towards doing something with it. Um, the, the time's just not yet, it seems like. You know, Harold's out with uh, Shirley recovering from her knee. So that's another thing that just means that we're not doing it right now. So. If you've heard a rumor that it's just been thrown out, that, that somebody didn't like it, that's not true. It's, it's just circumstances, and, and we'll see what God has, has to bring. It may be that that time's coming to a close and he's going to do something different. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm comfortable telling you when I don't know. <laughs> nothing else? No other good rumors? I know there have been a couple, but that's okay. Um, part of the reason I wanted to offer that up is, you know, there, there are probably are rumors out there, and a lot of times when you hear rumors, they just build on anxiety, and this is an anxious time, right? Uh, a lot's going on, you know, yeah, the economy is not doing great, so it's natural to ask questions about the financial state of the church. Uh, we do have COVID, you know, and we've got people that are struggling with COVID, we've got people that have been exposed, we've got people who aren't here today because they're, um, they're quarantined, you know, we've got all those things going on, uh, the elections, uh, everything else, uh, and the funny thing is, what happened to me this week was, um, God said, this is our turning point. You know, as a church, we, we, were, we were on a certain trajectory, and I think we've leveled out. 
And I think we're at a turning point, but with a turning point comes some challenges. And I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask about things because it might allay some of, um, some of your anxieties. And I want to tell you what has happened over the last two and a half years that I think prepare us for a turning point. One of them is, even though my preaching may not have been great <laughs> uh, early on, uh, we were really talking about God's story, his big story, right? And, and our place in it. And I think we've started to really consider that. I think that when we dig into Scripture each Sunday, there, there's a point where we're looking at, okay, how do we fit into this? How does the example of these people apply to us? Um, so that's one thing. You know, we spent a good deal of time doing that and continue to do that. Um, I think we see ourselves as part of um, a, a trajectory of, of events that we, we start with the record in, in Scripture, but it's continued over the last 2,000 years. We're a part of something. Um, I, I think another thing we've done is we started, we talked about the identity of the church. You know, this is a church with uh, a strong legacy. We date back to 1841. Um, I, I've heard some interesting stories recently that I didn't know about. Um, it's something about gunfire. And, uh, I, I think Mary Jane, <laughs> who told somebody's story about that, that, there was a shooting or something? I don't know. Anyhow, that's probably not part of our identity, but um, <laughs> part of the funny stories out there. Uh, but, our, you know, we we're a church that has a legacy. We love music, which is it's kind of difficult for us not being able to do that right now. Uh, we're a church with a history of missions giving. We're a church with, you know, all these things that are part of who we are. Uh, we even sat down and we did a first run at, at membership classes. Uh, you know, if you're new since we did our last round of membership classes, version 2.0 is going to be a little bit shorter, and it's going to help you kind of understand where we are as a church, how we're organized, uh, maybe what your place could be in the church, uh, those sorts of things. So we've done a lot with that. Um, we've talked about what a church really is. What's the composition of a church? It's, it's not this stuff. You know, we've talked about the fact that the church is the people. That's it, pure and simple. You know, when God calls everybody home, he's not going to call the buildings, he's not going to call the pews, he's going to call the people. And, and he'll have someplace else for you to dwell. Uh, so, you know, we kind of talked about each of us have a, a shape. Um, that was an acronym, right? Each, each of us is designed with particular passions and particular skills and particular uh, hopes and dreams and, and also given particular spiritual gifts. And they're all supposed to be fitted together to support the church. So we talked about all those things. We talked about purposes as a church. You know, we, we did the purpose during life. I didn't bring my, you know, we've had handouts and things like that. And we got that little diagram where the purposes sit across the top of the building that's the church and the pillars of the people within the church. Um, you know, so we've talked about ways of evaluating what we do as a church. And the turning point is going to be applying all of those things. Um, you know, so yeah, I think we've stabilized. I think we talked about that a little bit, so I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. But um, yeah, I think we're at a turning point as a church. I, we've been coming towards it. Ginger knows I've been worked up over the last probably a couple months, three months, something like that. Uh, second guessing when I was going to place some challenges out there. And honestly, I would have chosen this timing. I would have waited until you know, we get David Upchurch. I forgot to mention that. He's coming back on the 28th. Um, he's the church consultant. He's going to tell us some impressions and give us some suggestions. Uh, I know if you've been in leadership before, it doesn't just mean if you've been on the board or if you're really interested. Um, you're welcome to come to that. 28th isn't the greatest day. It's, uh, um, it, it's that weekend after Thanksgiving. Um, it was the only time we could find, and we still got to set the time frame. Um, but, you know, I would have chosen a different time, but this week really has pointed me in a different direction. Uh, there were a couple things about that conference. Uh, I met with somebody, too, that uh, another pastor I'm regular meeting in prayer with. A uh, couple things that stood out. One of them was to live your calling. And, and my calling is to be a prophet of the church. It's flat out what it is. And I think my anxiety over saying some things has been over the wrong things. Uh, it's been over worrying about maybe hurting somebody's feelings or maybe it's been worry about it causing some, uh, some issues. I, I want you to know I'm not attacking anything that's going on in this church. But I think we need to make some changes. And I'm going to talk about those. Um, the sermon title is no longer. And that doesn't actually even come from the, the verse, the main passage. What it comes from was when I was sitting down uh, in one of these encounters I had this week, uh, Isaiah 30, verse 15, 
was mentioned, and it had to do with dealing with anxiety and making a turning point as a church. It's an anxious moment. Uh, but I pulled from a commentary, and I pulled from the stuff right before and the stuff right after. And when I went to save the file, I thought, okay, I'm going to save it, just call it Isaiah 30, 15. And instead, it popped up with a suggestion, no longer. It came from, it was the first words in that little bit I pasted from the commentary. And I said, you know what, that's it. Uh, the verse itself, I'm going to read it to you. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, and repentance and rest is your salvation. And quietness and trust is your strength. I'm going to read that again. And repentance and rest is your salvation. And quietness and trust is your strength. So the commentator says this. In the context here, uh, Israel is contemplating another uh, uh, working basically again with Egypt. You know, they, they formed alliances with Assyria before this. They're contemplating forming an alliance with, with Egypt because they're threatened by uh, all kinds of things that are going on outside and they're anxious. And this phrase no longer, here's what the commentator has to say, no longer reiter it reiterates one of the themes of Isaiah and of the Bible in general. Jacob will finally put its trust in God and not in other places. Those other places have let the nation down and it has been disgraced. But there will come a day when God will demonstrate his power through them or even in spite of them. And they will be exalted. So when he talks about Jacob, you know, that no longer being a constant refrain, uh, he's not talking about the person Jacob alone. He's talking about the people of God. He's talking about Israel, God's people. And basically it's, it's talking about God's people rejecting the call to wait upon the Lord and trying to prosper in their own strength. And you see that pattern over and over again in Scripture. And of course it's one of the things that Isaiah rails against. Uh, the first time, if we want to go back to where it was first said is Genesis 35, and this is the actual man, Jacob. It says, And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Now you'll recall, Jacob has an actual meaning. It's a word. It means a serper. It means one who grabs the heel. Remember, as he came out of the womb, he was grabbing his brother's heel. He took his birthright. And God said, No longer will you be called a serper one who grabs his brother's heel. Instead, you'll be called Israel. And Israel has a meaning. It's one who strives with, that means one who strives alongside of God. And that was a turning point for Jacob when he quit striving with God, you know, along the river, and he became Israel. He became one who strives with God, strives alongside instead of against. Uh, so one of the uh, observations when David Upchurch first showed up here, uh, we, we didn't get exactly what we thought we were going to get when he presented but he said this, this is before you can grow, you have to be healthy. There's something implied there. The implication is there's something unhealthy at West Point Grove. And he got that from one thing, a SWOT analysis. Does anybody know what a SWOT analysis is? It's uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and what's the T? Uh, threats. And it was just our board members. We did one of these SWOT analysis, analyses. And he came back and said, before a church can grow, a church has to be healthy. So here's the thing. When you look at yourself in the midst of God's story, which I think we do pretty well, we started to do, we have to recognize times when we're on the wrong side of it. We have to embrace what he says, or it will never turn to blessing. And so I'm going to point out just two things. One where we're sort of out of order. Uh, and the other is where we're out of balance as a church. You know, how we acted like Jacob, maybe take the glory from God. So out of order, uh, I think I'm going to skip to, to the illustration I have. You know, a church can be out of order in a lot of ways. You know, all the pieces can be there. And I think all the pieces are here at West Point Grove. But if you imagine a puzzle, if you put the first few pieces together wrong, you know, that's got to be a big puzzle if you put them together wrong, you can never get the rest of the pieces to fall into place, right? You can never get a clear picture after that. You can struggle and you can struggle with it, but until you take those pieces back apart, put them back together again, you're not going to get the full picture. And I, I consider going through all these, uh, all these arguments about it, but I'm going to um, tell you one of the things that we've done wrong. 
Uh, we've allowed management and not leadership to define how we function as a church. And I don't think it's intentional. Matter of fact, I think that uh, there was a reason where it was very important for us at, uh, at a time in our history. But that pattern still continues, and we've moved on. Uh, I want to talk about the nature of gifts of the church. Spiritual gifts. And here's where we're out of order. It says, I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. If I were to summarize that, it's that we need to have honor for the other parts, for people who are designed and gifted differently than us. And there are times where only lip service has been paid to that. Where people have been told that they're being honored in this church, but they're not. They're being used. And I don't think it's intentional. But we've got to redirect, or we're not going to make the turning point. There should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part. And then he follows on with God's principles for order in the church and for the way things happen as far as gifting in the church. And each of you, if you are a Christian, has a spiritual gift. They're all to be honored. But there's an order to it. And God placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So I'm going to give you a basic description of a couple of those things. First off, apostles. In my opinion, doesn't apply to us. There are other types of churches who claim they have apostles. But the strict definition, those were people who lived with Jesus, encountered him directly. And we can say we all encountered him directly, you know, if we've accepted him at the cross, but it's a different thing. So first, then, it says prophets. And that's a weighty term, because oftentimes we think of the Old Testament prophets. And, you know, the Old Testament prophets, if they were following God, they were infallible. The Old Testament prophets, they performed mighty signs and wonders, right? But there's a difference. The Holy Spirit had not been poured out into his people. God placed his hand on somebody as a prophet. And the signs and wonders and the things that they did were basically just to validate the message. And if you look at each and every one of those prophets, they were doing what I was doing here today. They're diagnosing the spiritual condition of God's people. And then they gave them a way forward. And so the way it works out in the church in the New Testament era is God gives the gift of prophecy. And just like in the Old Testament, it's somebody from within a community. And you diagnose the problem. And you way to move forward. And you're not infallible. And as a matter of fact, there's a way to check yourself. And, and that's probably part of the reason that I have been hesitant to come forward. So I'm waiting for other voices to emerge. And I'm starting to hear them. There are other people that give the prophecy of this church, and I'm starting to hear some of the same things. So, desire that first. It's not something you ask for. I don't come over here and say that. That's my gift because I want to. Because that's an intimidating thing to say to a church. I tell you that because that's what God said. Prophecy and encouragement. Those are my two primary gifts. And that's probably why encouragement part is probably why I was afraid to say some of these things. But then it's followed by teachers. First of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers. That's the other thing. How many people have claimed that they're speaking for the Lord and been outside of the bounds of what Scripture says and reveals about God? So prophecy comes within the bounds of good teaching. And I see a lot of that in our church, too. We have some people I, I've enjoyed. John, I think you're, uh, the way you approach Sunday school is from a teacher's standpoint. Chris, I heard you say you think teaching, but I think there's a prophetic standpoint in what you have to say, the way you apply it. Within the good bounds of teaching. And then it starts talking about all these other things that happen, miracles, and gifts of healing, and helping, and of guidance. And so that's the next one. This is where I say management has been a problem. That word guidance is the same one that's uh, translated administration. It's the same one that's translated as, uh, what was the other? Um, it, it comes across as management. And unfortunately, in some places, it's translated as leadership. And, and that's not a, uh, an accurate translation. The word is kaironesis. And the way it's used in the Greek is to describe the helmsman of a ship. And the helmsman plays a very important role when it comes to
comes to a ship. I think about the pirate ships, you know, the big wheel, you know, steering out there. The helmsman makes sure that that ship stays on course towards its goal. Right? The helmsman basically manages the ship. That wheel turns that little tiny rudder and it helps direct the ship. So it's an important one, but the helmsman does not determine what the destination is. That's for the captain to determine. And oftentimes between the captain and the helmsman, there's an executive officer or someone else. And that's good order in the church. You know, if the, if the helmsman, excuse me, the helmsman executes the orders of the captain, they manage the boat. Uh, and there's a need for management in the church. There's a great benefit for it. It needs to be valued, but it can't be mistaken for determining the direction. Um, I, I was looking at a, another it's a church growth book, and I only got through the, the prologue, and this thing st stood out to me. It says, managers do things the right way. Leaders do the right things. So we need that leadership voice that comes from sort of prophetic voices, people hearing where God's calling us to do things. We need good teaching that helps us to set the boundaries. And then we need good helmsmen. We need good administrators to help us achieve those goals. Uh, and the difference is this, the difference between management and leadership, this comes from a, a very secular source, the Army Leadership Manual. It just popped up on my computer one day. It says you manage things and you lead people. And unfortunately, I think people have been managed in this church at times. You know, if you find yourself worn out and wonder why, it's because your gifts and everything else are kind of being used like a tool to, to move towards something and we don't really know what it is. We need to know what it is. We need to know what the goal is. Um, in administration, it enables goals, it enables mission, it enables vision, the vision of the church. Uh, we've been doing things the right way in order to accomplish, but we need to redefine what it is we want to accomplish. Um, and, and I think what, what's emerging is we need to be reaching out into these neighborhoods around us. We need to be evangelists. And, and don't let that intimidate you. Um, if you don't feel you've got the gift of evangelism, neither do I. We were talking about it downstairs. Uh, the call, um, Acts, I'm going to bring my Bible, because we talked about Acts 1-8. We're called to be witnesses. Some people have a gift of evangelism. They can go out, they can just chat up anybody, and all of a sudden, they're, I think that's going to emerge in our church. But most of us are just going to be witnesses, and we're going to be able to tell the people around us that love us and that we love on about the things God has done for us. And that's going to speak volumes, and that's going to be how evangelism happens for us. And if you're not one of those people that can do that, we need to see where it's happening in our church as it starts to emerge, and we need to use our gifts to enable that. That's the mission of the church, go make disciples. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey. And the Lord will be with you even to the end of the age. So we've had a tendency to focus on the secondary things. You know, on the, just the things we do uh, rather than on the, the primary things. And, and, and we've just got them in reverse order. But man, everything's there. I look at this church. we got good people. we got hardworking people. we got people with a passion for Christ. So we need to redirect. You know, if the helmsman takes over, it's, it's called mutiny. And when you realize that God's the captain, that's kind of a serious thing. Uh, but like I said, I don't think it's intentional. I'll explain why and how I think it may have happened. But the pieces are here. They're just out of order. So no longer, right? No longer can the cart lead the horse. No longer can the tail wag the dog if you want to pull those things out. Uh, but if we get this right, we're going to start to be able to raise up a new generation of leaders. That's something we're called to do. We're going to be able to focus on the right things. We're not going to manage too, too much. And we're going to be able to allow new people to step in, fulfill roles, and do things, and be discipled in that way, and learn in that way, and step into new roles. So the second one I said is we're out of balance. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I was saying about worrying about the chili supper. Sometimes we embrace our work as if God hasn't moved us on from a time when we were kind of desperate. Uh, and that's a source of some of our insecurity, too. We still feel like we're in those times. And, and that's not to say hard times can't happen again. They can. But I want to give you the example that, that, uh, that Isaiah was talking about. You know, Joseph went into Egypt at one point, right? 
It was not under ideal circumstances, but it was God's decision that he go into Egypt. It was God approved. It was God ordained. He was sent into Egypt. He was basically betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, sent to Egypt. And God did that so that he could save the people. It was God's providence that that would happen. I think that we have been in a similar position at times as a church. I think there have been times where we really needed some of the things that we focus on that we got a little bit backwards. Uh, I, there was a, I was asking about uh, the new side of the church, which I guess it isn't that new anymore. And uh, we talked about you know, taking out a dead instrument. And you know, as a matter of course, when you look at the Old Testament, I'm kind of opposed to taking out a dead instrument. So I, I kind of asked questions about that. I know there's people here that signed off on that, that took a great risk to do that thing, right? And, and what convinced me that, that God probably was saying, yeah, we need to do that, is when they talked about the old building. I didn't know the old building sat next to this one at the same time. The, what classes were taking place in it, and when it came time to remove it, to break ground, they just tapped it, that thing fell over. <laughs> Did I get that right? Okay. So, that's where I think we got into some of our patterns. Things like that, or things like when we did have months where $13,000 in the red. You know, and we feel a sense of desperation, and we're pursuing and going really hard after things to prop up the church. And, and at times it was necessary. God sent Joseph into Egypt. He's been, and he had to work hard, right? You had to throw all your passion, your weight into it to bring this church where it's at from 1841, you know? But then there came a time to leave Egypt, right? The place that they'd gone became oppressive to them. The Pharaoh no longer recognized them, it became oppressive. And you know what happened was when they left, there were people who pushed back against Moses. They didn't appreciate what God was providing, didn't appreciate where God was moving him, and it was sin for them. This is our turning point. We need to appreciate where God has brought us. We need to start making our turning point. We need to not push back against what he's doing, or that would be sin for us. <clears throat> so then later, when they were established as a nation, you know, the world around them started to threaten them, and they desired to go back. They started making an alliance with the Assyrians. Um, and then they considered, in this case, making an alliance with Egypt once again. And that's what we don't need to do. I, I see a lot of people who work really hard and maybe work so hard that they're really tired. And I think that some of that has caused people to bow out because they're just exhausted. And I don't want to see any of you bow out. I think some of you have been working very hard. You've been using your gifts, your administrative gifts, your gifts of service very hard. Let's recognize right here and now, God has been providing, God will provide, and God's about to do some things here. So for them, insecurity, anxiety led them to want to take control, you know, by whatever means. Um, they formed those alliances. Um, they rebelled against God. They even connived against his, his message, against Isaiah and what he was saying. Uh, but it was a God-approved thing at one time to go into Egypt, wasn't it? Just not now. It wasn't now for them when you look at Isaiah. Not now for us. So... Being out of balance for us means, you know, letting the good things of a former age outweigh what we're called to now. It doesn't mean abandoning those things. It means just putting them back in balance. Um, so I want to read that passage from Isaiah, or at least parts of it here. Uh, chapter 30, verse 1. It says, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit. He's basically saying, don't pursue these plans that put you into bondage to something outside of my word, my revelation, my plan. Don't make those sorts of, of plans. Don't form those sorts of alliances. I think at times we find ourselves beholden to things outside of the church, to things outside of the, the people of God. He talks about those who go down to Egypt without consulting him. If you skip skip forward, I'm, I'm kind of skipping the uh, the oracles of judgment. <laughs> you know, um, obviously they were doing something far worse than getting out of balance as a church. You know, um, but it says they see visions, uh, or they say to the seers, "See no more visions." And to the prophets, "Give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, 
and prophesy illusions. God's going to challenge us, and He's going to give us a, a vision of how to move forward. And like I said, I think the whole idea of evangelism as a church is intimidating to us. And it would be really comfortable to slide back into supporting evangelists, but not being evangelists. It would be really comfortable for us to work at, at raising funding so it can happen in Turkey or wherever else. We still want to do that, obviously, but not doing it here. And so we might tell people the vision for that, to settle down, you know? Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. That's never worked out well for God's people. A little bit further on in verse 12, it says, because you rejected the message and relied on oppression dependent upon us, deceit. Uh, oftentimes there's just another agenda out there and we fall into earthly patterns and how we hold to that pattern, hold to that agenda. He's warning not to do that. But then he gives the alternative. And that was our primary verse. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Verse 18, it says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up and show you compassion. For the Lord is the God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. He's telling us to repent and rest. To be quiet before him. And to trust in his strength. And that's where our vision will come from. I, I've got a couple of ideas of what that means. I'll share them here a little bit. Um, but that same commentator said, all your human conniving can't save you. Your only resource is God. And the good news is he wants to save you. Indeed, he will. So why go to Egypt? So we live in an anxious time, right? Anxiety, anxiety and insecurity, they, they tend to lead towards control issues, towards getting out of order. Um, that leads to manipulation. And when I say manipulation, I don't always mean, or necessarily mean intentional manipulation by people. I mean the enemy. We have an enemy, right? <coughs> likes to manipulate in those times. He likes to play on your anxieties, your, your fear of loss of control. And, and he'll, he'll whisper things in your ear. And he'll tell you to do things. He'll make you feel desperate. He'll tell you, oh, go back and embrace Egypt. Do the things that you did before. That saved you. He'll push you into your own conniving. Our sins probably sometimes we have a willing ear. Um, sometimes when we see those options, we enable it as a church. Oh, that's going to get taken care of. Cool. <laughs> we don't have to think about good order. First Peter says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. The enemy, the devil, prowls around, roaring like a lion for someone to devour. He's trying to sink his teeth into some people. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. There's a big C church out there. And they're anxious too. Some of them are probably receiving similar messages. It says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And that's a turning point that's being described right there. We've been through times of angst. I, I only walked with you through, through two and a half years of it so far. But it's time to turn. It's time to receive those blessings. So if we listen, we'll see blessing. So as far as good order, no longer confusing the task for the purpose. Oftentimes we're so focused on that thing we're doing right in front of us that we forget that there's an objective out there. There's a place we're headed. No longer letting others lead us down that path, whether it's the wiles of the enemy or, or somebody who... Uh, in the weakness in the moment, you know, tells us to do something that maybe is not according to God. We'll follow the emergence of the prophetic voice in the church. You know, the funny thing is, I've known two or three people. I, I, I listen. And uh, if I think God's leading us a particular way, I kind of want to hear some confirmation. It's emerging in our church because we're starting to get on the right path. And all of a sudden, your spiritual gifts start to flourish and they start to do things. So we'll follow that common voice. We're going to respect one another. So many of you have gifts of service. 
And, and the thing is, part of your gifts of service is also you need to have boundaries with those. It's, it's so easy to just say yes to every little thing that comes down. And But God's called you to other things, too. He's called you to take care of your families. He's called you to, to love one another. He's called you to all these other things. So what we'll do is we'll put people before institution. And the institution will follow. God takes care of the rest. He does. We'll put first things first. And as far as being in balance, you know, no more frantic striving. Let's not be fearful because we don't have one fundraiser this year. You know, that's going to be replaced with something else. God's got something else for us. No longer trying to succeed by our own strength. And that call begins to worship and love God first and then love your neighbor. So here's the thing. Here's, here's part of the vision that's out there. Um, I think we need to be a community that draws people in. When I told you we have everything, it's a great bunch of people. That's the first thing I was drawn to about Westland Grove. When I walked in, the first time when I was, you know, kind of trying to sneak in the back and check it out and see if I wanted to put in an application, you know, for pastor, I was struck by how friendly the people were. Mary Jane and, and Ken gave me the grand tour. They caught on to what I was doing. Um, everybody said hello. Uh, I tell you what, when we sit down in fellowship, the laughter, that, that brings joy to my heart. I remember about a month in, when people were a little less skittish, all of a sudden I started to see people standing out in the narthex and, and chatting and talking and, and enjoying fellowship with one another. That sort of fellowship is the best thing about our church. It was the best thing after shutdown, wasn't it? What was the thing you liked the most when we met on the lawn for the first time? Probably wasn't my preaching. I'm okay with that. <laughs> it was the community that we are. It was being able to love on one another. Not sure whether we could hug on one another. <laughs> you know, uh, Not sure what the circumstances were going to be, but that was what we missed the most. And that's what's going to draw people. You, you look at the demographic that we miss in the church. Uh, you know, as far as regulars, you know, uh, Katie and I, Emily, we're probably, and I'm turning 50 this week, good Lord. Um, <laughs> uh, some of the younger ones, right? But the demographic of people who have kids, you know, in school and everything else, they don't need a bunch of events. Matter of fact, they've got way too many events on their plate already. They don't need to do another fundraiser themselves. They, they probably have sold chocolate bars and done, you know, Lord knows what candles. Candles. I, I, I bought a candle from the neighbor kid the other day. Um, <laughs> But what they really are lacking is community. And we can offer that. We absolutely can. And you know when you start to offer community for somebody, when they start rubbing up against you, and we call it fellowship, fellowship can go from being friendly to being relevant to the most important things in their lives. Because when people start to fellowship with you, with you, when they start to become a part of their community, then you start to talk about what's real. You know the places where that happens in our church? Bible study. I don't know, it takes us, what, 15 minutes to get around to the, the lesson? And we you still go through a pretty good lesson. <laughs> Sunday school. we got a group of people down there, some people giggling in the back, being rowdy, you know. <laughs> Why did I point at Mark? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> where's Randy? <laughs> but then discipleship happens, too. We, we start to dig through acts, and we start to see it challenging us. You know, that's part of our path forward is being intentional about that. Um, so the thing about the, the chili supper, when I said that, is it was all hands on deck. You know, it's a great event. People worked really hard, did great things. Uh, oh my goodness, they worked so hard in the months leading up to that chili supper. And then the day of, we worked really hard again. And I was said it wasn't even necessarily the, the work the day of that concerned me. It was how tired some people got. But the other thing is, it's all the people who really work hard in this church, and who better to represent the church and be out there trying to fellowship with the people we come in contact with. That's my vision, is to just rein it in a little bit so that as a church, anybody we bring in, we have a chance to, to chat with them, let them see our hearts, let them see what God has done for us, maybe be witnesses. Oh, you're going through something? Well, let me tell you about the time I went through that. Let me tell you about the time God carried me through a moment like that. That's part of what we need to do in this year. So be the community that draws people. Carry our faith out in the world. You know, have that hunger for evangelism. And it, it, it's sparking. You know, I, I'm hearing it from some people. Again, not, not to be intimidated, but if you're 
If you're the one with the gift of evangelism, go out and do it, do it boldly. If you're the one that doesn't have it, be ready to be a witness, just like we talked about. And if, if you're so shy that you can't even do that, see where it's happening and support it with whatever gifts you've got. That's good order in the church. We support what's fruitful for God. I, I skipped ahead and I talked about fellowship leading to discipleship. <laughs> but commit to discover each person's place too. That's how we disciple. That's one of the things we talked about, you know, the, the way a church is, is put together. That's one of the things we talked about in terms of how we're gifted. If you don't know, consider what are your gifts? What has God given you? It's supposed to be for the building up of the kingdom. If you discover that, you start to pursue it, you're going to have some missteps. That's discipleship. But you're going to find that all of a sudden it's fruitful, and one day it's the most meaningful thing for you in your life. And it'll do great things for the kingdom of God. So we're going to try and discover people's place and raise up a new generation of leaders. The problem with being out of sync and out of order and those other things out of balance is that um, it, it, it stifles leadership, the development of leadership. Because we're so busy doing things the right way that we're not letting new people try and occasionally do things the wrong way. And, you know, so we cut their teeth. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> so we're going to be committed to raising up a new generation at Westwood Grove. I want, to, I want to just go back to this verse one last time. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. God's brought us to a turning point. I don't know what exactly this next year is going to bring, but it's going to be very different. It's going to be powerful. We shouldn't struggle against it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of your church. Lord God, I thank you for uh, this week has challenged me. This week has challenged my own sins, uh, my own reticence to, to say things. Uh, but this week has also pointed out your timing. And that is without accident. You accommodated. You knew the things that would hold me back. And you chose this moment to speak to your people, to place a challenge before your people. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that you are the living God, that your Holy Spirit rests within each one of us. I thank you that you've put all the pieces here that we need. You've always desired to be God in the midst of your people. You're here today. We place ourselves before you. We ask that you guide us forward. We ask that you give us a, a vision for raising up new leaders, a vision for discipleship, a vision for evangelism, a vision for doing the things that you've called us to do as a church, to go and make disciples, to be witnesses. To worship you. To love God first, and then to love our neighbor. Lord God, in this time of turmoil, as we look at the coming week, may we know your presence, may we know you're in control, may we know you have a plan, may we sit quietly and humbly at your feet and listen for the words that you would speak and wait for the breath that you are about to breathe into Western Grove. We thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.